Hello, welcome to Independent Thought and Freedom. My guest today is Brooke Potter, serial entrepreneur and business consultant for multiple businesses in Trinidad and Tobago, the United States and the United Kingdom. Brooke is also co-host of the Shitlord Preachers podcast. I'm going to have to put an explicit now on my, um, on my iTunes <laughs> because of that, but on Podbean and it is on iTunes. It's a libertarian discussion between former preachers about political and social events happening in the United States and the United Kingdom. He's presently owner and head portfolio manager at St. Clair Capital Management Limited, an equity, option, and currency hedge fund with various rental properties investments in the UK. Brooke was born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago and is currently living in the UK. Welcome, Brooke. Thanks for having me, Kirk. Good to be back with you, man. It's always a good time talking to you. Yes, yes. I'm glad to have you here. Now, I, I, to, to kick off the, um, our conversation, you know, we'll, let me start with a kind of icebreaker, although we probably don't need one. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but who has been your favorite independent thinker of all time? Oh, I mean, th there have been several. Um, I mean, I, the ones that have really impacted me uh, have been the ones that really push the ideology of freedom, uh, especially financial freedom. So I've been influenced by the people like John Locke and these guys, uh, Adam Smith in the terms of economics. And uh, more recently, like the, the, the person that impacted me when I was younger uh, was, of course, Robert Kiyosaki, who wrote the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I mean, there's a whole history behind that, but why that book kind of really resonated with me. And uh, I mean, these are the people that have really, you know, shaped my thinking uh, to be liberty minded and, and to seek freedom as the highest ideal in my personal life. Yeah, I mean, you know, what is so amazing is like um, with my guests so far, when I've asked them this question, uh, it's been the same people that uh, I mean, it, I'm not saying you've had the same uh, choice as my previous guest. But I mean that we are influenced by the same people. So my previous Absolutely. guest might have said other people who I would have been influenced by. And equally, Robert Kiyosaki. So I'm not just saying yes, yes, yes. I really <laughs> mean that yes, Robert Kiyosaki did change my life as well. I mean, that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it was amazing. It was an airport buy for me. I was just trying to figure out something. I, let me just check what they have in the bookstore here. Okay, this, uh, this looks interesting. I, I was intrigued a little. I'm not a self-help book kind of guy. That, that, that's not my type of reading. But for some reason, I picked it up and it was just amazingly awesome. What, what resonated in it for you in particular? Well, I mean, there's a bit of a backstory to that. So mm -hmm. uh, when I was much younger, um, probably around the age of maybe 10 or 11, go, going to do the, what would have been the common entrance examination back in Trinidad. So just prior to that, my dad lost his job at Coconut Growers Association. Okay. And About um, what year was this? Would you... I, I believe it was, it must have been after 1990, so it would have been 91, okay. maybe early 92. His so book came out since then? No, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to oh, why. Oh, okay, right. This yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was saying, wow, um, I didn't realize I got it so late. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, was, I was just about coming out of uh, primary school. So I was, I was on my way to Queens Royal College. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it really upset me. I mean, it, you know, we had to move house. I had to leave all of my friends. And because we lived in a CGA house, the, the, the company leased the house to my dad while he was an employee. And it, it totally rocked my worldview in terms of understanding that, you know, the, the typical path, you know, you get a job and the company kind of takes care of you for life. And, you know, you get a house and a car and, you know, 2.2 kids and a dog. It all, it all disappeared. Right. And so that was the beginning of me kind of realizing, you know, life really doesn't go according to plan at most times. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I did eventually go on to, do Q, uh, to Queens Royal College. I was a fourth generation there. Right. And uh, I mean, that's a whole story in itself. Yeah, and, and just for, for the international listener, the Queen's Royal College in Trinidad and Tobago uh, definitely was our most prestigious um, college at one point. Today, yes. I guess it has, it has lost its pride of place, but historically, nobody could touch it in terms of it's produced 
world famous thinkers like CLR James, Eric Williams, V.S. Naipaul, and and many others. I mean, it's uh, Rudranath Kapaldeo and and so on. I mean, uh, Carl Hudson Phillips, and uh, just just <laughs> amazing, uh, almost. Anybody who, who came out, especially during the colonial and immediate post-colonial era, I mean, it produced all our great intellectuals who went on like international stage. So, yeah, so you're fourth generation there. So, fourth yeah. generation. Now, I mean, for, for your listeners, they're not going to know this, but I, I'm probably considered a minority in Trinidad and Tobago. So. <laughs> right. No, that, that's, that's important, yes, because you are a white Trinidadian. Well, well white. what is your... Because j- just for the, the listeners, um, I mean, Trinidad is a fascinating place. And I'm not just saying this because, you know, I'm Trinidadian or whatever. I mean, even... Uh, it was a British colony from 1797, but before that it was Spanish, but it was a French culture. And so as a British colony, um, Catholicism is its main uh, Amazing, religion. Yeah. So that's Protestant, so unusual. Yeah. And then we yeah. call our local white class here French Creoles, even <laughs> if they have no French no. in their background. So Brookwater, exactly. that sounds like a, a totally British background. Is that correct? Uh, you would think so. Yeah, well, definitely on my dad's side. Uh, and there's, there's a long story with that as well. But it, it was, um, I think Lidlow was my grandmother's maiden name. They actually, I think, old land where um, Long Circular Mall okay. is presently. So mm-hmm. there's yeah, a long an history. An old plantation, there. right? Mm-hmm. An old plantation. Uh, but on my mother's side, it's very diverse. So my right. great-great-grandmother was of African descent. She was Nigerian with green okay. eyes. Okay. And she married an Asian guy, Chinese. And they ended up in Talparo. Did she come, this Nigerian ancestor of yours, did she come as a free person? Yes, yeah, as a free person. Again, a lot of people may not know, because in Trinidad and Tobago, the settlement is is very interesting. And maybe when you look into every island, it's interesting. But let me, but (laughs) no, I mean, there were many Africans who came as free people um, to Trinidad, not as slaves uh, in the 19th century. So that, that's, an, that's uh, an important place of, of, of the way we've been uh, populated. Yes. And so you're, yeah. you're an embodiment of that, actually. I'm an embodiment so. of that. You know, I recently did my DNA test and it's okay. like, yeah, 20, uh, not 20, but 16% West African between right. Ghana and Nigeria. But if, so. see, if someone looks at you, they would, they they would never guess. That. They would never they see. Would they would see just like a, a tyrannical white male. <laughs> <laughs> the last accepted bigotry yeah. class. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah i mean you know so going to queen's royal college i was one of maybe three considered you know fair-skinned white people in the entire school and stuff like that right and um the, well the second major thing that led up to me really having the impact from robert kiyosaki's book was when i was denied entry into sixth form at queen's royal college right. and it was just assumed that because i was fair-skinned I had money. I'm just going to go off to the United States, do my SATs and these types of things. And for the first time, the plan, you know, yeah. do common entrance exam, go to school, common, and into sixth form, then university got totally screwed up. Right. So shortly after that, I, I managed to get a so hand. Uh, hand uh, just out of interest. So, so that yeah. assumption that you had money and you go to the States, that, that was your assumption or that was other people's assumption? That, that was kind of put on me. Uh, right. The exact wording was they wanted to give it to somebody who uh, needed it more. Oh, so this is what the QRC officials told you. Yes. Ah, yes. interesting. Right. Okay. So, and, and of course, I mean, the, the sixth form is a limited, you know, there yes. are limited number of spaces and stuff like that. So I, I never... The person who told me, I didn't think it was, it was racially motivated. I just right. knew that they had a misconception about my Your, lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my yes, background. Yes. Yes. Well, well, you were someone from white privilege, so you didn't need, <laughs> so you didn't need that. That's, <laughs> yeah. Which was ironic, right? Because, I mean, the people in school did know I came from a broken home. And, you know, my mother was, uh, let's just say she liked to drink or two. Right. So it was, it was by no means any kind That's of upper right. class, but the address was rather prestigious. Yeah. They, they didn't mind that we bought the house many years ago when it was very cheap to buy and it just happened to be wealthy. But right. anyway, lo- long story short, after those two upsets in my life, uh, really directionless at about 18 or 19, mm-hmm. you know, uh, 
I was getting into trading around that time. It was kind of the booth of the online trading thing. So it was a company called Daytech in the US and I was working with them. And I stumbled what across- about What the, year was this, by the way? This would have been uh, early to th- late 1990s. So 1998, okay. right. just before because the- I'm, I'm trying to think point. of the state of the internet at that time. Yeah. Yeah, it was just, so, it was Windows 95 had come out right. and the revolution that was on, Netscape, yeah. it was browser wars. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I came across it in 2000, sorry, in 1998, 1999 is when I got Robert, Robert Kiyosaki's book. And yeah. he really made the case for me mm-hmm. that, you know, financial freedom and financial education needs to be paramount if you want freedom. Yeah. And seeing what the loss of my, my father's job And I mean, as I say, subsequently, my parents divorced and my mom was not in a very strong financial position. A major part of understanding, you know, just how money works and and how it creates wealth and these other things. It stuck with me since that point onwards. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I... you know, he, he has, you know, there are a lot of, of money books and personal wealth books and stuff like that. I, I think what, what um, hooked me in particular, for example, is he, he put it in a context that I've never heard anybody else do it. Buckminster Fuller. Do you know this man? Yes. Buck, right. Yeah. So I was introduced to Buckminster Fuller by Robert Kiyosaki. I mean, and Fantastic. Buckminster Fuller is a genius and an out there thinker, philosopher. Um, and I mean, whenever I hear people talk about Robert Kiyosaki, I never hear them talk about Buckminster Fuller. But Buckminster Fuller is an absolute inspiration to him. And, yes, um, right. and um, Fuller's um, book, The Grunge of Giants, and, and Robert Kiyosaki's book, The Conspiracy of the Rich. Because, right, so I'm coming from like a social science perspective and, and a kind of political yes. guy and all this kind of stuff and, and against the sort of injustice of the world and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, Robert Kiyosaki is actually approaching wealth creation personal wealth creation from that perspective yes. not just hey get rich and you'll be you'll have a you know a yacht and you can do whatever you want and that's great <laughs> so the dan bilzerian showing, <laughs> exactly he's showing how the system is geared to keep you down so that uh, education and this whole myth of get a job and and uh and you know, study hard, get a job, and you'll be taken care of for life. And how the the system is actually screwing you over with that. And there's Absolutely. a conspiracy of the rich and the way the banking system is set up. It's to make savers lose, and it's all to divert wealth to the people who really understand how money works. And that our lack of education of money is a huge part of our exploitation. You know, and, and that, so when he put it in that sort of context, it really, really hit home to me. Uh, it, Absolutely. Yeah, it fit into all my sort of uh, political and social and economic worldviews and made it very, very personal. You know? I, uh, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And I mean, I, I saw it. I saw it firsthand, you know, I mean, later on in life, I saw it in my own business dealings. But I think that was the biggest crux. So, so I mean, just to backtrack a little bit, when I was in Queens Royal College, um, I would get into these discussions with my lecturers. Uh, so I was doing like ad math and computer science and stuff like that. And I was always like, how is this helping me? How is this helping me get a job? How is this? I can't even do my taxes. How do I start a company? And I, I would challenge them a lot because what I thought was needed education was never being presented. Right. I think maybe that's part of why they got rid of me because I was, <laughs> I was causing too, <laughs> asking too many questions. <laughs> yes. I mean, and, and uh, the thing is, they probably couldn't answer it. Right? True. They themselves wouldn't, wouldn't know the answers to these things because, you know, as, as uh, you know, Robert Kiyosaki says in his book, you know, the A students end up working for the C students. C students, that's right. And the B that's students right. work for the government. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's, that's it. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he's quite amazing. I'm, I'm working on getting him on the podcast, in fact. That would be amazing. I yeah. think he's coming to London. I might try and catch him at the conference. That would be awesome as well. Yeah, he's, he's, he's really something else. But yeah, but it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm glad you, you, know, you, you put it in this context because I, you know, from looking at your profile and, and, and what you've been doing and talking about, and you, know, you, you have a, an online presence for, for a while, so I'm able to 
look at these things. Um, I, I, I definitely noticed a theme that, that I'd like to get into. And so I would like to ask you, since you've obviously been talking about this and looking at it before, you know, what do you think are the challenges facing young men today? And, and how are you addressing these challenges? Young that, men that, is, that is a huge question. I, I was actually asked this question almost 20 years ago at a, a TGI's in Trinidad and Tobago. I was actually talking with a social minister, social worker, and who's had connections to a minister at the time. And I talked about the plight, especially amongst Trinidadian young men, mm-hmm. of the lack of role models, the lack of fathers, and how the branding of what a Trinidadian male had to change if you okay. wanted to impact the community. And that was 20 years ago. <laughs> now, you know so, what? A lot of people say that, but I, th- I don't think they probably mean what you mean. Because, you know, like the Gillette Razor ad that just came out, the oh, toxic yeah. masculine, that They think masculinity itself is bad and masculinity should be outlawed. I, I, I don't think that's I don't agree with that either. For at all. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, um, well, in that context at that time, in the Trinidad culture, right. there was a very gang, gangster presence. That is and, correct. You know, the, this, this kind of permeated a lot of the, the youth culture. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of Jamaican influence from the music and stuff like that. Not, not that I have anything against Jamaican music. But the dance hall culture. Is, is, the dance know, hall culture. Glorifies violence. Violence. Um, sex, know, sexual. Yeah. Drugs and, and all that stuff. Completely agree. So when I, when I was having that conversation, I think it was around the time Brian Lara had come to prominence and, you know, winning the world record. And, uh, you know, we had these star athletes and I was trying to explain as like, yeah, a lot of the, this is what people aspire as like the ideal Trinidad male is an athlete. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you, we have to expand that because not everybody can run fast or bat in cricket and, you know, not everybody could write, not everybody could be a VS Naipaul. We need to expand that and find these people and really highlight it. But to bring it back to your point, today, 20 years later, <laughs> yeah. um, I worry tremendously for the state of masculinity, uh, especially amongst the young people. Yeah. Now, I, I'm probably two generations removed from you know, the young men that are coming up now. Yeah. Um, but this, this definitely animosity towards masculinity, uh, the phrasing of, of toxic masculinity, the disposability of men. Uh, I mean... <laughs> If the, if the ship is sinking, it's women and children first, right? Yeah. <laughs> Society has been built on the disposability of men. It's the men that have been going to war. Uh, you know, it's the men that have been building the, the, the society, building the buildings and all of these different types of things. And there's a coordinated effort now I see to tear all of that down. Yeah. Yeah. And that, the, the, the things that drove it, which was ambition, competitiveness, excellence, uh, the meritocracy, all of those things are now banned. Those are bad things. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I guess, you know, I, I, I don't feel like I'm old, but I am, I suppose. <laughs> uh, you know, I, but I am just shocked. At, you know, they have, you know, football games without, keeping score and <laughs> this type of thing. I, I just Participation pro trophies, yeah, you know? I mean, yeah. I guess they always had participation ribbons and stuff like that. But, but the, the, the fact is they don't want to say who's first, who's second, who's third, and what the score at the end of the game. It's just, yeah, it's okay. Sometimes as, as boys, we play for fun, and, and we might not keep score sometimes, like if we have a, a little fun game. But Correct. come on, not if you're going to have a proper competition. <laughs> and, uh, it, it's, it's amazing. And, and I don't know if, if you deal with this, and, and you can tell me if you do in, in your podcast or, or elsewhere. But, um, you know, there's, there are movements that are emerging. And I think a lot of um, what on the internet they call normies, and, and hopefully I have a lot of normies listening as well, and I can introduce them to, to these concepts, like MIGTO and neat, right? Uh, MIGTO, men going their own way. There's an entire movement of young men um, who don't want to get married. And, and, and then there's the neat phenomenon, not in education, employment, or training. It's a statistical category, I believe, from the UK sort of labor yeah. stats. And it's become adopted by, you know, young men who are dropping out of the system. I mean, ha- have you been sort of exploring oh, yeah. that at all? Definitely. Um, so myself and my co-host, Amos uh, Joe, 
uh, we spent a lot of time talking about issues in the manosphere. So, I mean, you, you've touched on that. There's the other one, which is the incels, the involuntary oh, yeah. celibates. Yeah. So uh, j- just to touch on it, the involuntary celibates are people who feel, it, well, they can't get laid basically, <laughs> right? Yeah. The Chad's because, and Stacey's and etc. Yeah, yeah. So they, they think it's because of how they look or they, they come up with these things and they say they're disqualified from the sexual marketplace. The MGTOW... Um, but, but, but just to go on the incel too, there, yeah. there's an interesting analysis um, that has some validity there that has to do with um, the sort of liberation of female sexuality there. So what they find is right. that all the women, um, uh, now that they're encouraged to be as promiscuous as possible, um, go towards all the alphas alpha yes. males so all the alpha males as usual throughout history have the choice of all the women they want um, but it's the incels are really paying for it because whereas before uh, where a woman would want to keep her chastity or, or whatever now uh, they they just go for these temporary flings and and the whole and it's destroyed you know the the bonds of marriage and and so forth yes and so there are these involuntary celibates I mean it's it's it sounds like a, a lot of complaining by nerds but it's a little <laughs> bit more than that and there is something to it I I, I think there is something to it. As, which is a, a result of the sexual liberation and feminist movement that, that is not acknowledged enough. So I, I don't want to dismiss it totally. No, People correct. People are trying to demonize it too because of, because, you know, a lot of the, you know, these, these boys, young men are, are also badly socialized. And, you know, you, you have that Elliot Rogers guy and, um, right. and, these peop- and, and another recent one, you know, who who actually, you know, committed acts of violence out of the frustration and so forth. Obviously, you know, that can never be, uh, you know, condoned and, and those people need to feel the full, ex, you know, full brunt of the law and, and et cetera. Um, but but there, there is a social phenomenon that, that, you know, that's rising this incel thing. Yeah. So, so no, I, I agree. I agree. No, no, no. So what, what you're touching on there, it requires a little explanation. So there's something in the manosphere called the red pill. Now, yeah. people use that analogy for a lot of things. They use it for political and uh, ideological and all these other things. But originally in the manosphere, it was understanding the intergender dynamics between men and women. Uh, so the works of like Royce and Rolo Tomasi, who wrote the book, The Rational Male, they really brought this information to the front. And it's exactly what you're saying. He says the social contract between men and women has changed. And the competition in what was known as the sexual marketplace, people don't understand it. So the premise is, and I'm not saying this is my view because you're going to get a lot of hate, but I'm just saying this is kind of how it's understood. That uh, the women's sexual, sorry, the men prefer women. They they find value in the sexual marketplace by youth, beauty, and fertility. So younger women will tend to attract more attention from from men. So women of a sexual consenting age, let's say 18, um, to about the age of maybe 26, 27, she's going to find peak in the sexual marketplace. Right. So at 25 to 27, she's going to get the bulk of male attention. Yeah. But men's sexual marketplace value is very different. Women tend to be attracted to uh, status, genetics, provision, and sometimes character. Yeah. And, and there's a very simple reason for that. If a woman was pregnant back in you know, our hunter-gatherer days, one, she wanted to make sure the child would have good genetics. So she would look for maybe height, strength or something like that because she didn't want to have to care for a disabled child. Two, she wanted strength because somebody's got to protect her <laughs> while she's incapacitated. And she needs somebody to provide for her because she can't provide for herself. So this, this is the genetic thinking. Yeah. So men's peak tends to be later on in life. We tend to peak out like 38 into our 40s and stuff like that as women start to decline. So this is kind of the sexual marketplace. I'm not, I'm not saying this is it. I mean, I'm not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I know that's I'm the argument. You're laying out the argument. Right. So and it, now what we get to, what feminism has done to this, right? Um, as well as the sexual revolution, the birth control pill and stuff like that. It is, it is kind of broken up the social contract. Now 
women are, as you say, being as promiscuous as men. Abortion as well is, is like the ultimate form of hypergamy because, you know, <laughs> they don't have to, they can have a baby with who they choose and they want the alpha guy. So they might get pregnant for the less than alpha guy, the beta guy and have an abortion. Yeah. So anyway, not to get too much into it. So that is the red pill knowledge. MGTOWs, incels, and what would be considered red pill aware men all understand this dynamic. Yeah. And we see how it's affected the laws in a country, for instance. So like yeah. no fault divorce. Right. I think in the US, it's almost more than half. I think it's close to 70% of divorces are initiated by women. Yeah. And in most cases, the women are going to get custody of the children. I think yeah. seven, again, 70% of the women are going yeah. to get custody. No matter what. I mean, the no woman, matter what, they, you know, they, they, they may be totally unfit mothers. And, and it's like, it's, it's like wrong to say that there's such thing as an unfit mother. It's like, we're not supposed to say that, that, that Correct. there's That's such taboo. a thing as an unfit mother, you know, which is absolutely ridiculous. Correct. Correct. And of course there's the alimony payments, yes. right? Even so just to kind of put some perspective on the equality issue, if a woman gets pregnant and it's her body, her choice, and I'm, that's fine. That's fine. The man has no choice. So she can have the child. She can have an abortion. She could give the child up for adoption. But from the moment she becomes pregnant, the father has no choice. Yeah. If she keeps the child, he's on the hook for whatever, you know, 18 years as the case might be. And even if he can't make the money, like there's a terrible story of this uh, 90s actor. You know, he, he was in a sitcom in the 90s. I think it's some, something Farrell. I can't remember his, his first name. He was in his prime when he had his divorce back in the 90s in a sitcom, making a lot of money. And then he lost the sitcom. He couldn't afford the alimony payments and he went back to court and they said, it doesn't matter. You have to maintain those payments, even though he's never going to work like that again. Yeah. So the laws are very gynocentric. They're very femme focused. Yeah. And the, so again, the three groups, the incels, they, they don't think they can compete. The MGTOWs understand the red pill knowledge and they say the game is rigged. There's no point in playing it. The school, it's not worth the squeeze. Yeah. And they've, they've checked out of the thing. It's all about focusing on themselves. And I would consider myself and what is needed, which is the positive masculinity, which is the red pill aware masculinity. is like, yes, this is how the game works, but there's a way to win, which is by being a better version of yourself. Yeah. Increase your status in the sexual marketplace. Mm -hmm. So for guys, if you understand, okay, you're peeking out and you're, you're like, not 38, 39, uh, into your 40s and stuff like that. Get your money handled. Get your physique handled. Educate yourself. Become a man of excellence. Yeah. But women will want to come and you know pay a bond with you and stuff like that. So I think those are kind of the three camps. I'm 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 more so a red pill guy than MGTOW, but yeah. It's a rising phenomenon. I yeah, it, it, it's it's you know it, it's really really something you know I I uh, it's I I really I used to feel very sorry for women in the let's in the nineties and two thousand and I used to see these um, educated um, you know uh, very successful women who couldn't find a ma a man and. Men weren't keeping up with the with the with um, you know with the progress women were making and and you know uh, I, and and I, I used to feel sorry I used to see you know women who were looking for you know you know for a partner but weren't able to find you know people that were equal to them and 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 men you know were developing so much more slowly and uh, you know of their age yeah. and, and this type of thing and and I used to find it a real problem and you know and and had a lot of sympathy towards women in their thirties, uh, approaching forties and they couldn't find anybody. And I, I think the dynamic has changed now and I feel more sorry for the men because I, I think, you know, women have just sort of discarded all that and, 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 and they act like, you know, um, uh, you know, the worst promiscuous men and, and, and they have no, um, no ambitions whatsoever to be in, you know, to, to have, uh, to be a homemaker. They, they, they look down on, on, on the whole idea of, of, um, of, of motherhood and, and, and keeping a home and, and, and those types of things. Um, and, and that, you know, they, you know, the whole promiscuity, the cheating, the, the hyper sex, 
of of the whole thing it, it i think it, it it that is um bad for the whole dating scene and everything with men and then when you get into the divorce and how you know the divorce the alimony the the custody of the children um these sorts of things that that's that's another part of the equation and it, it's just it's all these things are attacking marriage um, which is undermining society as a whole you know um, yeah. and, and, I'll, I have yeah. to touch on the issue because you've hit the nail on the head and there's a term for it so um, the, the term for women is, is hypergamy so yeah. you're talking about these women in their 30s and their 40s can't find somebody of equal or better status to marry yeah. And so for your listeners, hypergamy is, is, it's a complicated issue, but it generally means women want to marry up. They want yeah. to marry some all across mm -hmm. socially up or somebody of equal status. So yeah. whereas a man uh, would be will, perfectly willing to have a much poorer, yeah. beautiful wife, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, a woman just fell out of the dumpster. Is she cute? You know, it's, yeah. it's <laughs> men. And the, again, biological reasons for that men yeah. produce unlimited sperm for pretty much their entire life. So there's no discernment, but women have a limited fertility window. So they have to be more discerning. At least that's how it used to be. Yeah. So the most powerful man in the world, the president of the United States could get brought down by an intern. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And this is it. Men, men die for sex, right? Yeah. Men die. Women don't die for sex. No. <laughs> men die for sex. But I'm bringing it back yeah. to the point. So, this is what's ended up happening. So in, in previous times before the sexual revolution, birth control and these things, generally, you know, there was a, a good balance between the men and the women and stuff like that. So a man might be a 10, a woman might be a nine and, and they'd pay a bond. And even some people at the lower strata that, you know, some farmers, maybe a little overweight, or, they still would pay a bond. Yeah. But when the, the feminism pushed in the victim narrative for one and the entitled narrative for others, most of these women out here, and I can tell you definitely out here in the UK, they don't want to settle for anything less than a Greek god, mm -hmm. right? They want, they want Thor, and yeah. they want, you know, he's got to have millions and billions, and he's six foot, and, you know, all yeah. these ridiculous things. And there's nothing wrong with that. You have your standards, but yeah. the fact is, You're not, not everybody's going to live to that. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I mean, j just the six foot thing. Like, I'm not six foot. I'm, I'm like yeah. five, seven. No, no, so, I, I, when I say you're, I mean, I don't even mean you. No, no. I, I, I mean, the, the woman who was yes, yeah. that is not the equivalent. I mean, exactly. I, I don't know the, the, the names of the big stars, unfortunately. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I'll, I'll date myself, I think, like, you know, <laughs> Pamela Anderson or something like that. Right. Yeah. But this is it. So they would want, you know, these, these really tall guys. But the amount of people who are actually over six foot is probably like, 10% of the population. So any woman is choosing, okay, I, I want somebody who's at least six foot. You've just locked out like 90% of the av available men out there, right? And, and even while you are not in the top 10% of women. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And I've seen it. So yeah. and, I mean, and I, the thing is that the alpha will have a and, fling, have a and, fling with an ugly chick for a while. See what that exactly and, and, dumps to dive. Yeah, you know? he dumps to dives, right? <laughs> and this is what's ended up happening. So the top twenty percent of like the most capable men now have access to eighty percent of the women. And men didn't do this; women did this yeah. because of feminism, sexual That's revolution, right. and, and so they have made it hard for them. So before, where they were in one percent, you know, competing amongst all these other women. Now they're de competing with 80% of the women out there for this one guy. And he now has the pick of the litter. Mm -hmm. And as you say, the alpha male, Dan Bilzerian, right? I don't know if you know who that is, but he is like the epitome of just pure out alpha male living with like ridiculous models. And his Instagram is insane. <laughs> but that is what we've come to. And again, men didn't do this. Men are taking advantage of the system that, we live in today. In fact, I find feminism hilarious in terms of the advantages it poses to men. <laughs> like, I mean, like, ironically, like the, the whole like pro abortion thing, the consequenceless sex, um, it, it, psychological study after psychological study shows that women are far more negatively impacted by consequenceless sex. 
than Correct. men. I mean, men actually enjoy it. I mean, it is <laughs> exactly so exactly you know. mm-hmm. like somebody was explaining it. Um, I, I don't I, I don't know if this is scientifically accurate or not, but they, they were trying to explain to me about um, the serotonin. Is it the serotonin? The bonding chemical. I'm not. I think it's right. serotonin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the bonding chemical um, that women enjoy during intercourse and these other things. And what ends up happening is if they've had too many pair bonds, so they've had like multiple partners, they actually get desensitized to making those attachments. Right. So I think any, I, I don't know exactly, but it's things like 20 partners or somewhere around there, they actually lose the ability to have that deep, like personal connection with another human being. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're totally right. Men are just taking advantage, well, the alpha men, those who yeah. are aware of it are, are having the time of their lives. But yeah, it's women at the end of the day that are suffering from this. I, I, I'll give you a, a, a story from uh, my family, uh, which, um, you know, it's kind of bad to do so. But, uh, but, but I mean, it's what I've observed, you know, my, uh, in, in, uh, in, in my family, not my own, but uh, not my nuclear family, but uh, right. um, within the vicinity. Yeah, yeah. So, right. So s- seven girls. Right and uh, ra- you know, born and raised in you know, from the like forties to the sixties, right? So, so uh, the three old, old the, the ones that got married were the three older ones, right? And the four younger ones who grew up in the seventies, in the seventies, okay. yeah. So they 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 you know were partying in the seventies. We were young women in the seventies. Uh, none of them eventually got married. And I remember yeah. observing them and, and looking at the differences. Now I remember, you know, the three older women, they'd be complaining about their husbands, complaining about the marriage, complaining, you know, um, all, you know, all the time about different things and whatnot. And, and the, the younger sisters probably didn't like, you know, said, well, I'm not going to be part of that. And I'm having fun and, and, and all of this. And, and I remember, you know, there were men who wanted to marry them and they didn't and, and you know, and, and, you know, they want to be free and, and, and so forth, the different things. And then, you know, later on, um, you know, the, the difficult marriages stayed together. Um, they, grew, they grew old together, had, you know, their children, their grandchildren and, they have, and the uh, women you know, by themselves without, um, you know, without families, children or grandchildren. And, um, and I, I, you know, and, and although they don't say it, I, I can see that um, there's something missing. There, there, yeah. There's something missing and they realize it too late, you know, and, and, and this happens. And, and I think feminism is going to, you know, I, I think feminism is designed for maybe that five or ten percent of women who right. do not want that traditional thing and want to go to the moon and, and whatever. Great, you know, the, the Amelia Earhart's always existed, and you know, and you have your Camille Paglias, who I love to death. Uh, yes. You know, um, you know, you have these women like that, but they're not the majority. Right? The majority of women don't want to be just like a man. Right, they, they don't, right, and they, but they're forced to be, you know, and and uh, you know, this feminist ideology is pushing all women towards what this, you know, exceptional ten percent want to be, and I think that's creating a huge, huge social mess. You're absolutely right. I, there, there are two things I'll touch on that. Um, there is the great equalizer to this. Um, so, I mean, again, I, I credit Rolo Tomasi for this. He does talk about the different stages at which women go through. Um, he, the, the youth, it's the party years, you know, they're out having fun and stuff like that. And then as they reach their 30s, they're coming on to their epiphany stage where they realize that they can no longer compete, first of all, with them, their younger self, not to mention the girls that are now turning 18. Let as me they put a pause age. here. And yes. then all of a sudden... They remember sexual, uh, some sexual assault and they go on me too, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a possibility. Guys, do not you, send dick pics. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that, you know, this me too movement is a lot of older women 
you know, rem- right. you know, because now the younger women are getting the parts, and now the exactly. older women are sort of kicking the ladder <laughs> for the younger women who are also That's selling it. their bodies in Hollywood. That everybody knew about the casting couch. Anyway, correct. Sorry. <laughs> correct. But no, no, you're you're exactly right. So as I say, you're reaching the thirties and stuff like that. Anyway, there there comes a point in both men and women call the wall. Mm-hmm. Now, it, it could be physical. It could also be a mental understanding and. Most of the time for women, it's a mental understanding that they can no longer compete. And it's also physical. They can't have children. It starts to become very... And exactly. Their fertility starts to decline. Sometimes their looks start to decline. Now, men, men have a decline too. I'm not saying we don't hit the wall, but we hit the wall much later. Mm-hmm. And most women in their 30s and 40s and possibly you know, in their 50s making good life choices. But eventually we all hit the wall. We all turn into old grand people, right? Yeah. And then our value in the sexual marketplace is, is gone. And that Except is the for great Tom Cruise, realizing. apparently. I don't know why, but... Yeah. I don't know what <laughs> <Yeah>. he's doing. <laughs> he's like almost 60. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so th- that is the great equalizer. And I think this is something that needs to be talked about, especially with young women, that their fertility window is not something that is indefinite. That's right. There are a few that can freeze their eggs, and, and, but all of that's very expensive. And the older you get, the more problematic. That's right. You know, and Camille Paglia has actually addressed this very interestingly in talking about women and if, if they want a career, um, to really think about it. And, and you may, maybe you should start later, have children first, or work in a pause or, or something. But, but uh, there are biological imperatives, you know. And, and this is the insanity of the current feminist movement, which is now blending in with the gay LGBT and all that stuff, you know, it's so weird because they're, they're trying to deny biology, like the transgender thing in particular, right? They're, Correct. They're, you know, and they're trying to deny race. They're trying to deny sex. They're trying to deny all these things. Yet on the other hand, they're essentializing it. So you need more. There's no such thing as race, but there's not enough black people. Or there's, right. <laughs> there, um, there's no such thing as gender, but there should be more women here. And, uh, you know, uh, it's... it's the cognitive it's, dissonance. Yeah, it just uncanny. doesn't make any sense. And, and, um, and so, so you, know, uh, you know, my there's no physical difference between men and women. However, by 30, I know I can't have children anymore. I, it just, you know, it's it crazy. is, yeah, it makes no sense at all it's an insane program that's really causing destruction i i i just no i I agree and it's the women that are going to pay exactly exactly the whole society is going to pay because um, you know marriage is breaking down children growing up in one parent homes with bitter mothers and it's it's really something i wanted i wanted to touch on that second point though right Um, again you're talking about you know these women who are out there they're being successful um so I, I've been on the dating scene and so forth. I'm, I'm approaching 40 at this point. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of the dating profiles of either sometimes single mom, divorced, never married, into their 30s and 40s and stuff like that. And the way they're describing themselves, I'm ambitious, uh, you know, I'm working a hard job, I'm, I'm successful and this, that and the other. They're describing a man. Right. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) You are describing yourself as one of the guys, right? Guys are the ones who are ambitious, successful. Right. We and unless you're into that persuasion of being attracted to guys, you are again pricing yourself out of what is the value of women, which is femininity. That's right. Right. And this is because if if all the women are going to try and act like men. And most men are not inclined to be attracted to male behavior and, and, and male traits and stuff like that. There's no wonder we have the problems that we have today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think the biggest enemy of femininity is feminism. I agree. Yeah. It, I it, agree. Yeah. And that's a, a terrible thing. Now, we're talking about men in general and so forth. Uh, you're, a, I guess, a generation uh, a, a, away from me, uh, not quite in the MGTOW millennial era i suppose <laughs> no. but um but but you know what sort of challenges have have you faced as you know uh as a younger man from a different generation than me coming up a lot of them i like to ask older men as, as they've come up and uh, you as a younger man coming up and able to reflect back or i mean i i so i've had the pre-tinder era of dating <laughs> yeah 
and, and this goes back to something you were talking about, how the men today have, they don't have the social wherewithal to actually meet people, you know, the art of seduction in person because it's all digital now. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll get on to that. But um, I the was, art a, of I had, seduction is very important that you put it there. I, 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 I think it's a skill yeah. um, and I, I always promote it. So my experience is a little unique because I was a minority in Trinidad and Tobago. I was always exotic. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so I had a lot of fun. I, I was always going out, meeting people. I had no problem approaching women. I'll be right. dating three and four girls in a week. It doesn't mean I'm sleeping with all of them. I'm just right. going out meet them. And I screwed up and I, had, I learned a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, and later on, as I traveled and I tried a lot of that kind of stuff, I started to notice the change. So, you know, I, in, in the dating world, we use cocky funny. So you, you say something stupid, you know, you comment on something a woman is wearing and you say something like, oh, did you buy that new or, or whatever? Yeah. And kind of, kind of smug, but it's not too smug. Yeah. And it, it conveys value. It, it conveys high status. Yeah. When I used to do that, the girls that got it would laugh and be like, ha ha, you so silly. And, you know, yeah, the yeah. game was on. The game was on. That's right. Later on, that's that kind of thing. You, you can see the cultural shift. Mm-hmm. That they, they didn't want any snarl remark at all. And I'm, I'm not even talking like older women. I'm talking like in their 20s or whatever. And now it's downright hostile. Yeah. Right? Um, like just for an example, um, <laughs> I, I went to Thailand not that long ago and I got some great pictures with the elephants and, you know, okay. of course, with, with the tigers <laughs> as well. Yeah. Right. And I, I know that the tigers are drugged, right? The tigers are drugged and it's a, it's a, it's a tourist trap. They go, you take pictures with the animals and stuff like that. And it's terrible, Yeah, but they need the money to do the research for conservation and right. stuff like that. Right. So uh, there's a picture of me on a dating site with next to one of these tigers <laughs> and some woman, no, no introduction, just jumps on me, just attacks me in her first message. And it's like, how could you do that? This, that, and the other animal rights, you know, all, all the, all the spiel, yeah. right? And it's like, all right. I said, I'm, I'm also a humanist, right? I understand these people. If they don't do this, they don't eat. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. it, it's terrible what they do to the little elephants. I get it. But that little elephant is feeding the village. Yeah. Right? And coming from Trinidad, you understand that more than someone from the UK. Many times, yeah. many times, like actual abject poverty. I've seen it. Yeah. And again, a lot of these women and, and stuff like that, very entitled and they've never experienced that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not condoning it. I mean, it is terrible. I, I yeah. get that, but they're, but they're not hurting the animals. And there's no ideal. Um, there isn't, there. there isn't, but that it, it's, so it, it used to go from me being able to be flirty and, and, you know, social to that kind of pittering off to now women are, quite antagonistic (laughs) you're bringing up something that i'd like to hear your perspective on which is the difference between um women uh for for you as a man dating in trinidad as opposed to the uk (laughs) well i haven't been in the uk that long so (laughs) no but in, in dating in trinidad um again i because i'm a minority there's there's a lot of right like, oh, yeah that that makes and, a difference yeah the huge, ethnicity huge. And mm-hmm. yeah i mean if i go like if i go to when i was in asia i was a god like i was just walking down the road and women were fix, just grabbing onto my arm and walking with me so location has a lot to do with it that's right um but e- yeah even in that sense the Car- the caribbean in the general so where i've been in the caribbean this kind of feminism hasn't really taken root Right. I mean, if it did, yep. we wouldn't have Carnival in Trinidad. That's right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right? The music videos would look very different, and mm-hmm. don't even start with Jamaica. Right. That's um, right. <laughs> um, but the biggest difference for me, uh, in terms of how the women approach, uh, well, how how they respond to my approaches and stuff like that, uh, in Trinidad, it's very jovial. The Caribbean is very relaxed. In the UK you have to get over an apprehension because when you approach a woman, her first, she is naturally very defensive Mm -hmm. and it's not very normal for men to approach and stuff like that. So it takes a lot more work right? (laughs) out there in the UK, I guess in the West generally. Um, The key is dancing for me anyway. You know, if, if, if if you, you you show some moves on the dance floor, that that (laughs) opens up people much better. And that, and ironically, the nonverbal communication tends to be more powerful. 
Right. So that's how I, you know, that's how I was meeting people. Really? You know, and it's an interesting thing you, you talk about. I mean, one, one thing I would say in Trinidad, femininity is still very strong. Right? I think Agreed. in the world, as I, as I myself have traveled around the world, the, among Northern Europeans, whether they be in Canada, the America, or in Northern Europe itself, that is where femininity has been almost wiped out. Um, whereas, um, <clears throat> you know, femininity still survives uh, in Eastern Europe, Yes. Southern Europe. Yes. Right? Um, and, and also in Asia, uh, Latin America, the Caribbean, uh, Africa, and, and so forth, you know? So, so um, yeah. So there, there, uh, that's one thing. And, you know, there's an interesting thing. I, I don't think we can s spend too much time talking about it, but I didn't think about it until you mentioned it. And it's, but it's so important, which is about ethnicity, location, and masculinity yes right so uh so a white man which yeah. although genetically and scientifically you are much more mixed than that but people wouldn't know that uh so your value in the caribbean in thailand and in the uk are going to be very different very different right? <laughs> black men yeah. have been highly sexualized right especially in modern media and rap and so forth and, and, and so they have different sort of uh, sexual values and, 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 and uh, I mean, like in the marketplace, I mean, right? yes, uh, yes. Uh, you know, in different areas as well. Right. And sometimes also very negative in, in some places and also uh, in other places, very taboo and, um, and attractive awesome. because of that. Um, yes. Yeah. Be, be very much because of that, you know, and there's this whole white, black love, hate, sort of relationship that is uh that's intrigued me for a very long time and now me as an indian <laughs> man i think we have a very low <laughs> marketplace um <laughs> uh, you'd be surprised of, man no, not, I, I, not I, in I, london <laughs> yeah no, exactly i was going to say england yes. is the is uh very 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 different it, england is is kind of the, the place where indian men have a little bit more of a cachet. You, because you of would the, do better than me. The, the amazing Asian British culture that has been developing there through the movies, through the television, through the arts and, and stuff. They, they have really developed something special in the UK that's, that, that needs more examination. I've not seen enough. My interview with Farouk Dondi kind of explores some of that, but it is it's very interesting. But Definitely. yeah, but, um, but, but the idea of ethnicity masculinity location and value is 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 something um that should be just discussed a little more in, in future i suppose but, but i agree brought it we'll, up and i definitely... we'll come back to it we will yeah, yeah, I, I'll, yeah i'll touch on that as well like and this is something we know because of the, the wilds of feminism uh I was, for, for instance i have a very good friend of mine he based on my recommendation went to thailand had the time of his life and he met a girl and he brought her to england and I was like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> like, do you really want to expose her to, you know, the, the kind of lunacy of yeah. Western women and stuff like that, right? And we, we had a brief talk about it and stuff like that. And his plan is that he wants to move to Thailand. He, he wants to retire out to Thailand and stuff, you know, that whole thing. But in the discussion, you realize he can't keep her here because what made her so exotic and special for him out there, when she comes here, it's, it's not going to be the same. You know, yeah. she's, she's unfamiliar with it. She's no longer the little princess of the village, as they say. She's now competing with all these other women and, and the mentality changes. Mm -hmm. So especially for, for men who might want to travel and meet people and stuff like that, the location is important. And if you meet somebody special, don't take them out of that location. Um, so like one of, the, one of the dating guys that I used to know, I think he moved to Russia. So he left the UK. And he's like, I'm done with British women. They're all crazy. Yeah. He found a, an amazing woman out in Russia and he lives there. And that's, yeah. there's that's a lot of people who, who do that. You know, you, um, I'm sure you're aware of, of the joke. I was just pulling it up. Uh, I'm seeing two versions of it. Here's a European version. In heaven, the cooks are French. The lovers are Italian. The mechanics are German. The police are British. 
and the whole place is run by the Swiss. In hell, the cooks are British, the lovers are Swiss, the mechanics are French, the police are German, and the whole place is run by the Italians. <laughs> wait, 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 but uh, the, that's, that's close. I'm, I'm so, let me see. The, the Asian one is more what I wanted to point to. In heaven, the food is Chinese, the women are Japanese, and the houses are American. In hell, the houses are Chinese, the food is Japanese, and the women are American. <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's but, true no i i, I mean I, the the global distribution of of these things of of, of femininity and and other things but yes. but the, the femininity part that's always a punchline where the wife is and the wife the hell part is that the wife is american or the wife is british western any any yeah. kind of western yeah, yeah. Although, I, I not italian no italian and french agreed right so as i said southern europe and eastern europe right so so that's why you have all these ukrainian women russian women mm. czech women all these sites that you get when you're browsing online and oh meet meet this woman or meet that woman you know that when google and facebook are <laughs> the profiling of you and and sell their cookies to corporations and political parties <laughs> <laughs> no you're right you're right. in fact i i did a couple of trips with a russian girl and uh you know a ukrainian girl and stuff like that and they, they're so much easier to get along with. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Russians expect you to pay for everything, but that, that's right. a cultural thing. Yeah, but. well, that, I mean, that's what old femininity was like. Everywhere, <laughs> exactly. everywhere. Of everything. Yeah, even in England and America and all that, you know, I mean, it's just a recent thing that that's been um, abolished, you know. If, yeah. if, if, if young men, unfortunately, don't, can't, were born after that period, they can look at old movies to, to see that we're not <laughs> right. But for I mean, those of us that remember, we remember these things. This is how exactly. it actually and it was. When it's done, when seduction is done right, it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Like I, I've been in scenarios and stuff like that and the words don't even have meaning. It's, it's just all, you know, it's, it's physical expression yeah. and stuff. Like that. And it's, it's, it's an art. It's an art. Yeah. You're in and a different zone. Yeah, you, you are. It's, it's subconscious communication. Yeah. And uh, to bring it back, you know, to what I see as the issue for young men today. I mean, we, we're, we're dealing with almost 40 years of men raised by women. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, since, since the agricultural era and, you know, men left for the factories, there's been a decline, especially after the war and stuff like that. And then, of course, everything else with feminism. Uh, so men, young boys no longer have access to their father like they once did to see the displays of masculinity. Now, now I, I fall off to Jack Donovan and his definition of masculinity, which is, you know, you must have strength, excellence, and honor in the brotherhood. Yep. So you, you, you're, you're physically strong, right? You have some kind of competence in the tribe, right? You, you're not just there for decoration. And you have honor amongst the men you've, you've got your, yeah. your your tribe in a sense do you know what i, I in, in my thinking of masculinity i've come to define masculinity by responsibility you're absolutely right and 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 that all those That's things are yeah. crucial to respond correct you must if you're responsible you must be strong you must yes. be courageous you must have honor if you yes. are responsible because in the end a man is supposed to be responsible for his family for the society, for his community, and, and whatnot. And, and, Fully and, agree. Yeah, and, and a man, uh, and when a man is irresponsible, he's a boy. He's not a man. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And because the role of a father, I mean, amongst the millions of myriads of things that they're supposed to do, the big one is to push the child into adulthood. So, that, you know, a child comes, mommy, mommy, I, you know, I want to play on the swing, and mommy picks him up, puts him on the swing, right? Daddy, daddy, I want to, I want to get on the swing. He's like, well, get on it, <laughs> you yeah, know, and he exactly. teaches the child how to get on the swing, right? right? That's right. And that lack, that, that, this is why we have, like you said, the, the Neats and the, the MGTOWs and these others that have kind of checked out. Yeah. Because nobody taught them how to push through. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, I can speak from experience. My, my dad, he wasn't there. We didn't have the closest relationship, uh, you know, long story. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this I had to learn for myself. And I learned it much later in life. Yeah. And, and now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to speak about it. I'm trying to encourage people, you know, you need to learn these things to be competent. Well, this, this takes me to another thing I'd like to discuss with you, which is um, 
your journey to become a pastor. That surprised me. It really <laughs> surprised me. And in a very interesting and, and pleasant way, because, you know, especially in the manosphere, I don't think I've ever come across a former pastor. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but, uh, but for, yeah, so for that's the listeners, interesting. I, I'm a former pastor. Well, not really a pastor. I'm a, an itinerant minister. So I used to travel okay. to church and, and speak. Um, I kind of gave that up in 2015. Okay. I, I kind of felt, but how that happened, actually, it, it, I'll try and make it brief. I, I, yeah. I don't know how we're doing on time, but yeah. um, I wasn't raised religious. Okay. My mother was, you know, a non-practicing Catholic. She went to a boarding school and hated it. So, and my dad, you know, Church of England, but never practiced. So we didn't have a kind of religious kind of upbringing and stuff like that. So when I was younger, I was, I was a Buddhist. You know, I, I got in touch part of my heritage as Chinese and I really connected with that when I was younger and I got into Buddhism and had a shaved head. If anybody has pictures, please don't okay. share them. <laughs> and my whole time at QRC, I had a shaved head. And, and oh, kind of stuff. Yeah. Really? in Trinidad. Okay, very interesting. In Trinidad. Yeah. Because that's not usual in Trinidad. Just No, no, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, it definitely was. I couldn't do that out. now. Yeah, they would have accused me of white being, man. <laughs> <laughs> they were going to KKK. <laughs> But um, yeah, so I was practicing Buddhism and, and all this kind of thing. Anyway, so after I got kicked out of Queens Royal College, I went to a technical college called, what was it? It's Bordercom International, right? It was, a, it was a school that taught computer networking and all these different types of things. Paid a lot of money, close to 10,000 US in those days, which was King's Ransom. Yes. And I sat in the class and the, the teacher of the class suddenly started talking about God and Jesus and, and the whole thing. And I was upset on, you know, I was just angry. Yeah. I was sitting in the chair, like I did not pay money to hear this man preach at me. I want to learn what I need to learn to pass these exams. But I couldn't get off the chair. Like I couldn't like open my mouth and tell him to shut up and let's get, get on with it. For some reason or something held me in the chair. Mm -hmm. I went out there for the lunch break and I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, this is not, this is not normal. And I, I heard a voice say, because it's true. And I, instant conversion experience. I was just like, right. it just, everything opened up for me. And I went home that evening, put on Christian television. My parents thought I was crazy. <laughs> and right. Right. I was like, oh, this is what, this is the same thing the guy was saying. And I became a, a believer, right? Any now, I, I did church? No, I didn't have a church at that time. I was listening to everybody. In fact, it was Jehovah Witnesses that got me to read the Bible. Right. Even though I, I don't agree with anything they say now, when I read the Bible, I kind of said, no, I don't agree with you. Yeah. So I would listen to anybody. Right, I just, just wanted to know it all. Anyway, I mean, th there's a lot that went on. Eventually, yeah, the same I was guy... introduced to Christianity through Jehovah's Witnesses myself. So, very... yeah, yeah, yeah the door to door I... thing that, that's a good marketing <laughs> campaign. They that is giving you literature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That John Wesley, the one thing they do right is the evangelism, which is the John Wesley model, how he built the Methodist church is go door to door, right? Mm -hmm. and, anyway, long story short, the guy who ran the school eventually started his own church. Uh, this is many years later, I think more than eight years later. And he used to do it in his classrooms, right? So he'd meet on a Tuesday in the classrooms of the school. And then eventually they, they bought a building and, you know, we'd meet in the living room. It didn't even have chairs or anything. We'd sit on the floor kind of thing. And that was like the first church I was involved in. And I helped them kind of build the whole thing up. Okay. And I was there for, this is much later. This is what, coming into my thirties at this point, um, now, were there these was a, local Trinidadian? Local church? Trinidadians. Right. Okay. Local Trinidadians. I, I was in like some of the big ones, you know, um, yeah. uh, Christ Castle at one point, Trinidad Christian Center. Okay. Um, I was very good friends with a pastor out in uh, Trin City. I used to go out there, uh, Trin City Christian Tabernacle and all, all good guys, all, all good people and stuff like that. Um, but I, I was going through a lot of suffering, even though with all this faith and everything, I was going through personal suffering. I was like addicted to pornography. I was, I was, just guilt and nothing seems to be working out. Now, um, I, I could, could I ask you? Yeah, sure. I, I have found that a lot of people that, that get into um, religious conversions, mm -hmm. whether it be with Christianity or like in Hinduism, there's like Sai Baba. Yeah. And, and, and these other things that people sort of convert to. I, in my dealing with them, I have almost always found it to be true that it has happened at a, point of deep pain in their life going through a divorce losing a child something like that and and the religion 
gave them personal the comfort strength. Yes. in that time. And they had a community that was right. offering support at that time when they felt they had nobody else. Uh, would you say the same was true with no, you or no? I can't, no. At, at the time when I was at the school, I was, I mean, I was probably lost. I was confused as to what I was doing. I just got kicked out of, of QRC. But I can't say that I was in any kind of pain or any kind of loss. Um, and I didn't have a community. The minute I kind of came to it is like the, t- the Christian television was kind of my church. And I was right. listening to everything. It, even though it conflicted, it, you know, it didn't matter. Um, it only became a real issue when I actually did join, help, help to build this, this, this church. And I was involved with them. And eventually, it, it just wasn't working for me. Like a lot of the, the supposed, you know, a lot of the dogma and a lot of the thinking and stuff like that. Um, I was just suffering. It was just piling on guilt. It's all about you're a rotten sinner. You're, you know, you're a bad man and, you know, beat yourself into submission sort of thing. And I was doing a lot of that self-inflicted to the point where I couldn't take it anymore. It's like, I'm, I'm done with this. Okay. So, so it was like, um, so a deconversion well, uh, process after well, not, with a very much intellectual sort of thing. Right. It, it, it was, well, basically it was a challenge. It was like, God, if you're real, you need to show up. Yeah. Right. Because I, I'm not doing this anymore. Right. And he did in a way he, he, he really, uh, not to get all theological, but I, yeah. I definitely had an encounter. But what I realized at that point was that everything I thought I knew was wrong and I had to start over. Mm-hmm. And at that point I went from, you know, being one of the, like the leaders in this church to being public enemy number one. Oh, and, so they were attacking you. Yeah. So I, I changed my doctrines entirely. Uh, I adopted a more, uh, I guess, Eastern Orthodox interpretation rather than the kind of uh, Western. Very evangelical. interesting. I'm very fascinated by that because in my, uh, and, and I'm very fascinated by that because I think historically <laughs> um, the Eastern Orthodox church has the proper claim to be the church of Jesus Christ. And yeah. um and I think theologically that's fascinating as well because I, I find the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, for instance, the whole idea that God became man so that man be, could become God. Yes, correct. Is very much in line with Hinduism, yep. uh, Buddhism. It's, so, you know, it, yeah. it, it is, um, it's, it's fascinating, you know. Um, You're and, absolutely right. And, and, and I think, it, and I, I, I believe Jesus was essentially... Um, uh, Indian mystic, a, a yogi or a Buddhist that, yeah. that, you know, that, that he probably went to Kerala because Kerala was the, um, well, what was it? The Malabar coast. That was the right. ancient trading route with Rome for the spice Rome, trade. Yeah. So they yeah. had the, an old Jewish settlement there and the Romans were there. So that's where St. Thomas went to establish yes. the church after anyways. And there's an ancient university there, apparently with records. Of, of Jesus and Plato I went there. Fully I, say that's possible. Yeah, Plato went there. Pythagoras yeah. went there. Who was a vegetarian, believed in reincarnation, etc. Right, so, <laughs> so all, all these things are, are connections are there. And G, Jesus looks like a, a yogi. He doesn't look like a <laughs> rabbi, right? He doesn't. In many look, ways. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, yeah. Uh, if you um, and so so that's interesting that that um, and I know in the states there is a movement among evangelicals yes uh and born again who are now moving to the eastern orthodox church because their critis- their criticism of the roman church yes uh, initially the protestant church uh, yeah, yeah. And initially had them as protestants as born again yeah. protestants but then later on they had their issues with protestantism and <laughs> exactly. then they realized that that first schism that produced the roman church away from eastern orthodoxy so yeah, yeah. so, so yeah. What, what was your path to East, eastern orthodoxy? well it, it it was a slow one so right. after after i i, I took a, a break from the church and i, I challenged god he showed up I, I got it. I, I can't remember who gave it to me. Somebody gave me a message. I, ca- I can't remember who it was. And um, I listened to it and it, it was basically laying out the Eastern Orthodox uh, position that Jesus was the last Adam. So in the Christian tradition, you know, Adam was the first man. He fell, sent the creation into, into chaos. Jesus came as the fixer. He came as the last Adam to crush the work of the first one and reboot the creation. And he did it for everybody. You know, believer, non-believer, there's no difference. Right. That was the message I heard. And at the time I thought it was absolute blasphemy. <laughs> because yeah. The, yeah. 
the theology had not lined up. And it took two years for all of those pieces to kind of see it in scripture and, and, and work it out. And um, at that time, I met, I met this traveling evangelist. His name was uh, Pete Cabrera Jr. That was the founder of Royal Family International University. Royal he, Family refers to which Royal Family? Well, that's what he called it. It's the Royal Priesthood of Believers. That, okay, so it's not the British Royal Family. No, it's not the British that's Royal Family. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was a great guy. He, he met me in, in Trinidad at one of the churches in Curep. Um, I think it was the Prayer Command Center. Rohan Rambali was, was the pastor who brought him. And he and I just got on like two peas in a pod. Mm-hmm. And he said, you got to come with me. And he took me around the world with him, you know, uh-huh. to teaching and preaching. And I did yeah. this missionary thing, you know. And as I say, it took that long. Eventually, he and I split. But, but was but, he of the Eastern Orthodox persuasion? Uh, he, he was more, of, uh, more like the charismatic right. type. Yeah. Right. Anybody looks at him on YouTube, he's got like a lot of healing videos and stuff like that. Great guy. Love him to death. It's unfortunate that we've parted ways as we have. But so it was, it was really like that. It was right. realizing God was bigger than the theology that I had. Right. Because I mean, this is some of the, the interesting things about the Eastern church that, that God is not contained within the Bible itself. That, that Correct. That is not contained within one book and that it's living. Correct. And, and that also... People don't really like the Latin church. The, the New Testament is written in Greek. Right? <laughs> yes. The, the yes. language of philosophy in the ancient world and the educated is Greek. And that's what that's the, right. the Eastern church, Greek Orthodox, that, that is a language. And so the Western church, the Latin church, they always sort of look down upon because yes. it's, they didn't speak the language of the gospels. And the, the, the early church thinkers wrote in Greek. And that's any right. educated person, person uh, you know in the mediterranean world was a greek speaker you that, exactly. that was a, not latin latin was administration for, for, the, Rome. <laughs> for the state exactly yeah, you know, and so, so that i find interesting and then also the fact that the cultural imperialism that's part of the western church is not part of the eastern church you have Correct. the ethiopian orthodox you have the that's egyptian right. orthodox you that's have the right. orthodox church in india you have the serbian orthodox here and yes. and these divisions are not theological divisions they're administrative divisions exactly managing yeah. the nation that's Correct. right and and so so um in the ethiopian orthodox church it's not a white jesus with blonde yeah, hair exactly. and blue eyes you know and um and in the in in the Syrian church in India, it's it's not a, again a, a white hair, blonde hair. That's all the things exactly. I've complained about about Christianity, how it brainwashes people into thinking God is white, the angel is the angels are white, the yes. uh, the you know Christ is white, your Savior is white, and all everything evil is black. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, None there, of that. yeah, there isn't that. There, there isn't that at all. It, it it adapts itself to each national circumstance because it's truly universal i, I find that all that fascinating correct i, I mean it, it was very difficult to come out of it um but i i as a point on that is the day that i had to kind of oppose the church that i was in mm-hmm. it really taught me to stand on my convictions mm-hmm. like even if everybody else was against me and at that point time it really was everybody was against me yeah. i was denounced in trinidad christian center and people said take him off facebook if you're a friend and i mean just heights of you know, yeah. <laughs> this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I stuck with it. I was like, no, this, this is what I believe. And eventually I went on to write for a, a syndicated Christian website, uh, christianstt.com, I think it was. Right. And those, those, over 200 articles, and they've been translated into probably every language under the sun, and just sent out. Mm-hmm. And so do, do you deal with, your, with these issues that we talked about earlier, like MIGTO, NEAT, and, and that, do you deal with them in a Christian context and, and <laughs> christian um that, that's that's ironic yeah. um I'm, i think i'm going to have to in fact i have an interview coming up pretty soon uh i wouldn't say his name but it's to deal with exactly this yeah. M- the manosphere and masculinity in the realms of christianity because especially with the evangelical church it's very feminine yeah and men are, are are kind of submitting to the female imperative and, and they're giving up the strengths that the church really was meant to have. And yeah, I do deal with it. I get Christians who email me to this day asking me about, you know, I'll put it to you like this. All of the church wants to get married because they want to have sex because, you know, yeah. sex is 
It's right. this forbidden sort of thing. And they're all praying to God, expecting a man or a woman to fall through the ceiling, land on their bed with a ring, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they're taking, you know, the Exodus account with the, with the, the Hebrews being yeah. fed manna from heaven, right? And I keep telling them, it's like, remember when he was doing that? That was part of their punishment. Yes. Right, you're asking for God to basically replicate the punishment of the of the Jewish people, right? Yes. His ideal for them was to for them to go in and take the land and yeah. work the land, right? So there's a little practicality in in that. Mm-hmm. And because all of these, a lot of Christians are stuck praying for relationships, they don't know how to actually have relationships. Yeah. And I think that's that's probably going to be where I'm 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 going is helping think, people bridge that. I, gap. I think. Um... I, I think that one of the, the challenges is that in the modern world, um, uh, the idea of, of speaking of God or, or the soul and being an intellectual, it, it, it sort of dismisses you um, because they, they just reject it flat out and, and they ridicule you, I, yeah. you know, just like they are another religion, you know, and, and, and it takes, uh, and I think that, um, I think many Christians have also done themselves a disservice by not being able to speak in that context as well and, and to show up the limitations of, of the materialist um, point of view, which, you know, which Aristotle attacked, I think, quite effectively and definitively, you know, Agreed. like more than about 2,500 years ago. I mean, uh, uh, Aristotle's attack on materialism is just amazing and, and, Plato's attack on postmodernism, I think, is is definitive. We think postmodernism is new, but but if anybody reads the Republic, Thrasymachus is exactly. the postmodernist, right? <laughs> that there's the thing, there's yeah. no truth. There's only power, and yes. he, he demolishes it. You know, and and Alan Bloom's brilliant book in the '80s, The Closing of the American Mind, um, who's a translator of Plato, deals with that brilliantly in the PC wars of the 1980s and it it still stands up today but I think today someone who is kind of occupying that space is Jordan Peterson Uh, and he's able to you know he's having these debates with Sam Harris around the world bringing in like 7,000 8,000 people Um, and and he's not necessarily arguing from a Christian perspective but he's from arguing from a from a perspective that 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 takes metaphysics seriously. Correct. You know, and that is important. You know, I, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, that, you know, doctrinal arguments need to be, uh, need to enter the academy or anything like that. Not at no, all. I agree. I yeah, agree. But, but, but the idea that um, metaphysics, which has always been a part of intellectual history in the West and elsewhere, um, need to be brought back, you know, and, and, and there are certain subjects in the humanities, for example, let's say poetry, how can you talk about poetry without talking about the soul? It's correct. Possible. Correct. You know, exactly. I mean, and, and there are things like that. And when you get into the arts, you know, you know, it's, it's, this is metaphysical and yet you don't want to speak about metaphysics. It's, and the whole idea which Jordan Peterson brings in about meaning in life, how correct. meaning is central to our psychology and without meaning um, we live disordered lives. Yeah. Um, and and we're a total wreck, and it's alcoholism and dependency and, uh, and, 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 and yeah, all sorts of things, you know. And um, and that meaning has to tie into something bigger than yourself, which means metaphysics, you know. Uh, right. Yeah. So so uh, I, I would definitely look forward uh, for for you to to take up that challenge. Well, t- tell us about your podcast. Um, Sure, sure. So, I mean, just briefly, it's it's my friend Amos Joe and myself. He's out in Minnesota in the United States. He was actually part of the ministry team of Royal Family International. So he and I did did he spend time in Trinidad or how how did No, he didn't he didn't come out that time. The team actually came together after he took me off (laughs) off the island, right? Right. So but we met in Thailand on a mission trip. Okay. You could the videos of us on YouTube and stuff like that. Uh, he was the youngest at the time, and he and I just hit it off, you know. just stayed in touch. It's about 12 years, my junior, I think. (laughs) And um, he and I kind of went through a very similar experience. And a lot of the arguments that we saw in the church, we see it in the political and the social commentary we have going on right now. 
mm-hmm. the same types of cognitive dissonance and the, the failed arguments and you know the fallacies and these types of things. So where once we were defending ourselves from other pastors or interpretations, we were defending ourselves from the news, right? And we were yeah. butting the articles and, and whatever. Um, so because, around the same, know, a, a lot of these yeah. things, feminism, LGBTQ, whatever, whatever, whateverism, uh, they are religious in nature. The the the, the fervor, the dogma, yes. the um, you know. Yeah, totally. The reactions the to heresy. Yeah. yeah, the blasphemy. Yeah, mm-hmm. from veganism to yeah. state power. I, and I mean, the, the, I think I don't know if it was Nietzsche that said it, but once the state, once once God is dead, that's right. Profound statement because he knew God wasn't dead, but mm-hmm. he was saying right. that once that decay had set in, it was going to affect everything. That's right. But we need something to hold on to. So some people find an ideology, they empower you know belief in the state or some kind of moral agent. Yeah. So we're always trying to fill. That's right. They transfer their belief in God into something else. So like I, I would else. say Dawkins, for example, believes in evolution as God. As Yeah. To- yeah totally evolution agree. is God for, uh, for, for, Correct. The, for these new atheists. Yeah. They just yeah, substituted yeah, totally a new agree. God, ev- evolution, Darwin. I mean, yeah. It's, and it's, it becomes untouchable. You can't, you right. can't. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I, I mean, getting, getting back to Amos and myself, uh, I kind of stopped doing it in 2015. He stopped before me, but we kept keep these conversations going. Right. And a couple of times we'd meet and people would overhear the conversations and it would be these lively discussions. So he decided to launch, um, well, I, I launched my YouTube channel. He launched his. Right. And he's not putting up much content. I, I have a bit more on mine. Right. But one of the things he did was these live broadcasts where we would discuss these issues and have guests on and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And he named it, you know, sorry All for right. the expert on, <laughs> on your iTunes. <laughs> but, uh, and I warned him about that is we're going to have marketing issues. Um, but yeah, we, I think we're on to 40 episodes at this point. Um, we were picked up by the Think Liberty Network, which is right. one, of, one of the biggest libertarian networks out there. Excellent. Was, yeah, subsequently picked up by Being Libertarian, which is the biggest social media libertarian group in the U.S., so, so are you, um, so, so your, so your podcasts are broadcast on those networks? Well, it goes out on Think Liberty. I think they, well, it's complicated. I can't get right. into the contract. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But, um, Very yeah. Good. So, so one of them, one of them definitely at least once a month goes out on the Think Liberty network, uh, which we're, we're very grateful for. But uh, much like you, we've decided it's better to control the content and the library, you know? Yeah. So we're doing a lot of our own stuff. We're, we're kind of trying to keep it independent as much as I can and just use them for distribution. Right. And, and, and that's so, where it is. No, that's great. And, and here's another thing because it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's good to see you doing all these things, right? Because yes. I think that that's important for, especially for young men who are, who may be listening, um, you know, that, that we need to, men need to do things. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, I agree. And, and another thing is your hedge fund management. Could, could you just get into uh, right. more about that? Just explain, explain what it is. I guess people sure. might not even, many people wouldn't even know what a hedge fund is. What is a hedge fund? You hear well, it all the time. What is it? Right. Uh, apart from, you know, funding the devil and like yeah. everything evil in the world. <laughs> yeah. George Soros. No, a he- a he- yeah, yeah, Soros and these guys. A hedge fund is basically... Um, it's, a, it's a, a fund of money that could basically use anything to make money. And they make money when things go up and they make money when they go down. Um, some of them, for instance, there's some hedge funds that fund lawsuits. Like if there's a big company that's like a Pfizer screwed up a drug and they think they're going to win a big settlement, a hedge fund will put money to fund the lawyers to win the case. Right. And, and so that means if the lawyers win, they have to pay back. They have to pay back a certain amount, a percentage. Right. Correct. Yeah. So it, it's really unlimited in the potentials of people can make money. Right. In my case, it's really I, like gambling, isn't it? What's it? Well, it's, prob- it's probability. <laughs> yeah. It's probability, <laughs> right? Gambling yeah. is chance, and the house has an edge. In trading, yeah. but I mean, one of one out of fifty-two, you know. I mean, it's I know <laughs> it's a small chance, but you play the numbers, right? Yeah, so yeah. there are millions of bets taking place in the long run. They yeah, average yeah. out. Uh, I'm, I'm not that complicated. So I, I run a small fund. Um, it, it's mostly my own money. Uh, I got a few small other investors that step in and I buy and sell U S equities. So stocks in the, in the U S 
Um, I do hedge. So I, I, if, I, if I'm taking a position expecting the market to go up, I will protect myself in case the market goes down using options or sometimes, you know, some other derivatives. Right. And, 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 I think, and just to, to explain yeah. this for people who, who don't, um, who, who disagree to, because this, this is what Robert Kiyosaki is talking yes. about. We get back to the beginning that they have all this complicated language, but this is the stuff that's manipulating everybody and keeping yes. some people really rich and other people really, really having poor. the poor subsidize the rich. This is Correct. what happened. Right. So, so let's explain these concepts. So, so um, the options are basically, it's kind of like betting on whether a share's price is going to go up or going to go down within a certain period in the future. At a certain period of time. Correct. Right. And then Correct. somebody will kind of basically take that bet. If, if you want to put it in that Correct. way. Yeah, that's a uh, say, okay. I, okay. I, um, I, I will get s- so much money, uh, so I, I'll buy it at that future price that yes. you think it's going to go to. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and then what you're actually hoping for is that it's going, it's going to be actually higher than that price. So that exactly. even though you're paying a higher price than today, it's yes. actually going to be worth way more than that. So you would be getting <laughs> a deal, right? So although Sometimes, you're paying, yes. yeah. So yeah. if it works out, that's how yes. it is. And then the other thing, the other way, the options going the other way is that, well, in three months, I actually think the stock is going to go down. Uh, but I'm willing to buy it at this price for you now, from you now, in three months, because you know what? If you don't take it now, you're going to lose way more. You're so right. Do you want to take my thing now or do you want to wait in three months? It's like, let's make a deal. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. And, and, and this is kind of, this is like this, you know, I, 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 I don't want to insult you or whatever. No, no, but, no, no. But yeah, I, I think the stock market is just like institutionalized gambling, which is what the whole right. crash was. Now, because then people started to take people's life savings, yeah, retirement bets. funds, yeah. and, and, think, and start to bet on it this way. And they yeah, lost. Huge leverage. Correct. Yeah. And Correct. they just lost everything. And people lost their life savings. They lost their retirement. And these bankers got bailed out. You know? Correct. And, you know, Correct. So, so, um, it, I mean, that's a good discussion. We could get into it sometime. But I don't, I don't, but you're doing a hedge fund now uh, uh, because listen, this is a system, it, it's giving you, you know, um, some independence, right? Correct. I mean, at this stage, after the incident with my dad, I, I really didn't want my future in the hands of other people. So I, I always went entrepreneurial and, and made deals. And in fact, the first option that I ever did was on land. It wasn't even in the market. Okay. So there was, somebody had a piece of land in Maraval. Right. And I said, okay, I will pay you this amount of money. It was, you know, not, not substantial to buy this land within five years for this price. And in five years, if, if it, it expires, they keep the money. Yeah. And it, it just so happened the area developed. I executed the option and I made, you know, a pretty substantial amount of money right. buying it at the fixed price below what it was worth. Yeah. Well, you negotiated I, five years ago. So that, that's a form of an option. That's right. Um, so I do the same thing in the markets. And, and I wouldn't disagree that there is definitely some gamblers in the market. 90% yeah. of traders lose 90% of their money in the first 90 days. Right. Um, I, I was trained by uh, the Institute of Trading and Portfolio Management. That's uh, Anton Creel's company uh, from, uh, was it BBC's Million Dollar Trader? He was the, the star of that. Right. And uh, Gregoire Dupont Equities, he, he was with the Institute, he's, he's gone independent. So those are the guys. And it, it's as simple as, as what you're saying. If you're a casino, most people are coming into the casino, they know they're going to lose their money. Yeah. But the casino knows because they have a statistical edge, the more bets that are played in the long run, they're going to make money. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing when I approach the market, except I approach it from the perspective of being the casino. Mm-hmm. I know I have an edge right? So whether it's technical or fundamental or, you know, whatever the case, maybe I got a tip, you know, I got an edge. And I know if I play as many edges as I can, statistically, I'm going to make more winners than losers. And there's a lot of risk management, you know, you don't want to, you know, yeah. <laughs> lose money. But so I have to constantly be putting on trades. So I, I, I come from it from the perspective of a casino, I have the edge, the more I do it. So and it's, ask, it's paying the bills. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah I'm sure. <laughs> when it's yeah. done right, it certainly does. Um, <laughs> uh, when, um, uh, so for our listeners, 
if somebody wants to be, you know, as interested in this, uh, is it easy or is it hard to, to be a hedge fund manager? How, how easy is it to get in the game? It's, it's, I mean, the biggest obstacle is capital. You need money to right. get into it. Uh, the Forex world is a lot easier. Uh, it's a lot cheaper uh, to get in because there's higher leverage. So you don't need as much cash. Um, and what you really need, and I will say anybody who wants to get into this, don't get into it blind. For the love of God, don't do that. Find a mentor. Find somebody who's doing this. They've got a, a reputable system that's making consistent profits. And you, you absorb everything you can from that person. Do you so mentor anybody? Uh, Are you at I that wouldn't, stage yet? I wouldn't, I'm actually finishing up a mentorship at, at right. the moment. Um, so, I mean, there, there are different strategies, long-term and short-term. So I'm strong long-term. I'm, I'm improving my short-term <laughs> game, as they say. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've, I've helped people. I've helped people who, you know, they come with me with questions and stuff like that. Um, but it, it wouldn't be right for me to mentor any, anybody because right. the material isn't mine. Right. Okay, it, because I was going to say if there's, maybe somebody could get in touch with you if, if they're listening. Oh, no, no, no. I, 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 would, I would point them to, to the Institute, the ITPM, so Anton Krell School, and I would... Um, also say Gregoire Dupont's, uh, you know, GregoireDupont.com, I think. He's got great stuff. Excellent, so, excellent. Yeah, definitely. But I, I want to get to the closing part of our interview and, uh, and, uh, and ask you a few questions here. Yes. Like kind of summing up, looking back. You know, like if, if, if you're looking back from, to where, from where you are now, if you could start again, you know, would you change anything? Or, or what do you know now? that you wished you knew when you were 20? Wow. Yeah, I would change a hell of a lot. <laughs> the number I, I must, one thing. Let's say the, the number, number one, one thing. thing the one. number one thing. Um, the number one thing I would change. I wouldn't waste so much time on things, on business ideas that were not solid. Right. right? So f for me, stocks and real estate is the foundation of wealth as far as I'm concerned. Some people inherit, you get lotteries, but most speculate in stocks and real estate. And I spent a lot of time in businesses that I really was not that passionate about and I was not really that interested in. And I wasted a lot of money <laughs> pursuing these things. So I, I, if I would say that, I'd say, don't, don't waste your time chasing every little idea. Focus on what, you know, the core passion that I had. And I would have done this a lot sooner. Right, right. And... Um... Let's see, do, who would you say, did you face, you, you mentioned some of it before, personal opposition from like either people or groups. Were, were, were there um, uh, people that you've, you've really had to personally fight against to sort of reach where you reached? Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah. I, I've shared a bit about the church story. Yeah. Um, that's, that's somewhat ongoing. My own family, has been, you know, they haven't been the biggest cheerleaders. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you know, I mean, my dad has passed on now and, and he never really got to see where I, I got to, but he was always disappointed that I never went to university. You know, my whole family's filled with like PhD doctors and lawyers and well, doctors and uh, researchers and stuff like that. So when I didn't follow that path, I, I basically got branded the black sheep of the family. So I, I would say those have been my biggest and ultimately myself, right? Um, you know, when, when I started in this business, I had a lot of fear, a fear of failure, a fear of all these things. And I really had to kind of deal with that and push through that. Yeah. And I, I've kind of been like my biggest critic for so long. But I, yeah, those, those have been the big ones that I've had to confront. Right. So would you say in, in terms of fears that you may have in, in trying to achieve what you're setting out to achieve, um, what, what, what would be the biggest fears that, that you have, and have to be. <laughs> um, if I have to move back to Trinidad, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, fear of failure is the big one. Yeah, you know, losing the Everybody. money that I've got now, and I got to start over. I'm, as I say, I'm approaching forty. It's not that it can't be done; it just gets harder. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. to raise money and, and do these different yeah. types of things. So yeah, it, in in the past, when you've had to, you know, face your fears and challenges, what what would you say, you know? has been the most important thing to give you the strength to do it because we all need strength somewhere to, to face these challenges and fears to get out of bed on our worst days, you know? Yeah, correct. I mean, early on it was the driving force was to take care of my mom. 
I, right. I can say that. So in my early 20s and stuff like that, business was all about taking care of her. Uh, as her drinking developed, <laughs> uh, it was about escape in right. a lot of ways, right? And as, as soon as the opportunity came where she, she's in a great facility now, she's getting the help that she needs. I don't have to be there as much. Um, the desire for freedom has been the biggest drive for me. And I, I wouldn't deny, I, I mean, I, I don't preach anymore. I don't do all of that, but I, I still have faith. You know, yeah. I have faith that God is always with me. And mm-hmm. in those really dark times, I, I get comfort from that. And that's picked me up to carry on in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, that's not something that people should dismiss lightly. You know, that, that's I something do. that we, um, we all need because we all face very difficult challenges in our lives. And, and without, with, without something like that to push us through, um, you know, no matter what it is we're doing in life, um, we'll never get through it. You know, and I agree. That's what you I do. agree. Uh, so final thing. What would you recommend to a young person listening to this podcast? <laughs> um, it, well, if, if, it's, if it's a guy, I would definitely say um, read the Rational Mail, get involved in the manosphere. Um, you got time on your hand. You got time on your hands. You know, don't rush into things. Really, really take care of yourself. Uh, if it's a young lady, I'd say be careful of the noise. There are a lot of you know, uh, influences out there that are not trying to be good to you. And it, yeah, in, in the same sense, I think a lot of people need to be true to themselves, really discover who you are and what you want in this life and, and try and figure that out as early as you can and find good people to help you. No, none of us can do this alone. I, I definitely didn't. Um, yeah, I, I would say that's the best advice I can give. Oh, excellent. I want to thank you for coming on my podcast, The Chat Brook. I, and I want to congratulate you and thank you for your own podcast. And I want to recommend my listeners to check it out. Right. We're going to have you on as soon as we can. So I'm looking forward to returning the favor, my friend. Excellent. Well, great. Well, that's all for Independent Thought and Freedom this week. Please join us again next week. And in the meanwhile, make sure you subscribe, leave me a rating, Like and share this podcast with your friends. Thanks and bye for now.